Okay, ladies and gentlemen, what a strange time that we're living in. Um, I'm trying to seek out conversations, not only because I'm going crazy uh, being by myself, but I'm trying to find uh, people that I look up to, people that I think have something really interesting and important to say. And so, you know, we talked to a chemist, we talked to a philosopher, and we've talked to a philosopher twice now. Um, I got a psychologist coming on the horn. We talked to somebody from the health field. I think a really interesting question to ask in a time like this is what is the perspective as to what's going on from someone who is an expert in religion, but not just any one particular religion, but someone who is an expert in world religions. And so I'm super excited about the conversation that I'm going to have today because I'm being joined with someone that I know for a fact is not only an expert in this, but is someone who is just so engaging with her students, so engaging with the Springfield College uh, community as a whole, bringing speakers to campus, hosting events, trying to get people interested in the relevance and, uh, uh, and just the, the importance of what religion has done in the past and where it sits now. Um, and also what, what baggage comes with religion. So I think that in a time like this, this is a really interesting question or a really interesting uh, chat to have. So let's see if we can get it started. All right, Kate, can you hear me? I can. Hey, James, how are you? Wonderful, Kate. Thank you so much for joining me. So as I was, I just gave a little, little introduction to um, about who you are. So I'm very, very thrilled that uh, Professor Kate Dugan can join me. Um, this is a this is a strange, strange time we're in, huh? Yeah, it's been um, nothing sort of short of strange. Absolutely, may define what we think of as weird now. <laughs> yeah, I to I totally agree. So. Um, I gave a quick little spiel about kind of uh, why I thought this conversation would be interesting for either my students or whoever chooses to watch this. Um, but for someone who hasn't met you yet or hasn't taken a class with you, why don't you tell me really briefly uh, who you are, what do you teach, and kind of what got you interested in that, in that field? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, Kate Dugan, and I teach religious studies at Springfield. Um, and I am currently teaching religions of the world, contemporary Catholicism, I teach religion and sports, religion, health and healing, um, all these sorts of things. And I got into it because I actually grew up quite religious, um, quite Catholic, and um, always had lots of questions about what it means to be religious, why people are religious. Um, I got to grad school and realized that you could like actually make a career out of asking those questions. <laughs> uh, and so here we are. I'm a scholar of American Catholicism. I wrote a book about um, Catholics who evangelize on college campuses. Um, and right now I'm doing a research project, two research projects. One is on Catholics who um, practice what's called natural family planning in their families and um, a book of essays about Marian shrines. Um, across the country. Wow. Wow. Yeah, so that's, 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 that's quite a lot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's fun. I, I mean, I love it, right? Like it's just, uh, I think religion is weird and awesome and fascinating, confusing, and uh, really powerful. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, you know, it's obviously physics, right? You know, um, but I think a lot of people, a lot of people forget that at one time, long, you know, I guess long ago by our standards, but not long ago, right? The people who did math, who did, who did philosophy, who did physics, who did theology, these were all the same people. It was all the same question for them. Yeah, and I mean, right, it's a question about what makes, what makes the world go round. I mean, I always think, my students often think, oh gosh, religion and science, they're totally opposed to each other. Uh, and I'm like, wait a second, I'm sure the founders of whatever scientific discipline you're thinking of were, were Catholic priests at, yeah. at, at some <laughs> level. Um, so yeah, yeah, there's not the answer. I, we're going to come, we're going to come back to that because I, I had a second conversation yesterday with, with Bob that was, Bob had me talk to his philosophy class, intro philosophy class, about an argument oh, yeah, nice. for the existence <laughs> of God that invoked cosmology, okay? Oh, nice, okay. And so, of course, the way that my conversations do, they typically went off on a tangent, so I want, I want to bring <laughs> you into that conversation, and maybe we have to get the three of us together, but yeah, before, right. <laughs> before we get there, um, so that's, that's really awesome. So what do you do for fun, I mean, in a normal world when you can actually do stuff? Yeah, um, I'm a long distance runner. I love running, um, I like hiking, spending some time outside, that kind of stuff. Awesome. Okay. You teach a lot of students every semester. 
I, you know, every, from every account that I've ever heard, you're amazing in the classroom and students love taking classes with you. Um, what's something that your current students probably don't know about you, but that they might find interesting? That, yeah, this is, so this is always a tricky question. What my answer is that for uh, about a year and a half, I lived on a boat in a marina in Western Washington. Like a houseboat or just like on like a yacht or like a, a sailboat? It was a yacht. Yeah, it was a yacht. It was a liveaboard yacht. We like, you know, worked on it and took care of it and I grew plants That's on the dock. And amazing. So I, I don't often men mention it in class, so I bet students don't know. Okay, so we're going to have to have a whole, a whole follow-up conversation on that because of a thing that people <laughs> don't know about me <laughs> um, is that if you ask me what is my, my ideal retirement plan, I want a sailboat. <laughs> and I want to live okay. on that sailboat. Um, yes. but, but there's two interesting things that go along with that. I don't really know why, because number one, I can't swim, and number two, I don't eat fish. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I was a vegetarian until I lived on a boat, I have to say. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, that's funny. So you've got some nostalgia about sailboats. Not, yeah. not the end of the world. <laughs> I never actually sailed one myself. I sailed in one once, and okay. it was like a friend of a friend of a friend like set it up, and we went out maybe about for half an hour and the boat started taking on water and we had to return to shore. Yeah, that's not, that's not awesome. <laughs> <laughs> I felt like it was me. It was my fault. I was the whammy, you know. <laughs> you brought the bad, uh, the bad swimming juju. That's right. All right. So, so that, that's awesome. So I, you know, we're in like crazy weird mode here. You know, how, how are, how are you, how are you handling this from, from both just the personal sanity and also from the teaching aspect? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I have to say I'm really missing teaching in person. Um, when I was sort of recording lectures to get things ready to go to Brightspace, I, it made me really aware of how, even when I'm like lecturing and feeling like what I'm doing is delivering information, it's really a dynamic. Like I rely on students' questions and feedback and even like your students facial expressions yes. where they're tuning out and where they're not like it was just like shooting in the dark so I've been it just feels like yeah steering blind for sure as far as the teaching goes um and then I have a third grader who luckily is pretty independent but you know I have to ramp up on my new math skills and <laughs> you know she's learning the ukulele from her music teacher right like it's all a little oh. chaotic <laughs> Yeah, it's really cool, actually. But awesome. Yeah, there's like lots of lots of moving parts. So I, everybody's. I, I played uke for years, so if she wants to get on Zoom and do like a, a jam session. You know, it'd be totally awesome. She's loving it. Yeah, so they did. did uh, what's the name of the song? I don't know. An old Nickel Creek song. It's fun. Awesome. That's really. Yeah. That's that's really cool. What Absolutely about some nice things? What, what about some things like, I mean, so we, we at Springfield College, we were lucky, right? We had the spring break and then we had a yeah. nice, uh, you know, a, a prep time for all this. Um, what do you think is different? Like, like there was the abstract of when it was going to happen versus now implementing it. What's different about it? What, are things as bad as you thought? Are they better than you thought? What is, what is your, your thoughts on that? Yeah. I mean, I really feel like students have stepped up to the plate. Um, they're doing the bright space stuff. They're figuring it out. They're asking questions. Um, it, it seems like fa other faculty are too. And I think that's sort of awesome. Um, I mean, like, it seems like a lot of stuff has like gone online, which is maybe weird, but also just, just great that people are just picking up with the available modes to do stuff. Um, you know, I think I was thinking the other day, like one of the weird things about zooming with my classes is it's, there's like, a, there's like a shadow of sort of sadness about what it's not. Like yes. Zoom is trying really hard to be this thing, but it never can. And we all know it, but we're all just trying to like go with it. So there's, I was thinking that there's sort of a sadness um, in each of these Zoom sessions that we're, we're not able to actually do what we really want to be doing. Um, yeah. Yeah. So that's just... I feel it. And, and <laughs> although, although it's, although it's sadness, I agree with that feeling, right? Cause you know, it's like what it could be, right? Yeah. At least it's something as opposed to, like you said, the, the, the shooting in, in the dark and just pure silence, right? I'd rather this, the palpable totally. sadness than the silence, you know? Absolutely. Yeah. And I do think like students are, you know, rising to the game and like my class, one of the classes is at nine thirty in the morning and I know 
you know, not all of them would like to be up at 9.30. So, I, you know, I think students are doing a good job of just going with it, which is, you know, a, a long-term life skill, I suspect. But, yeah. So in a, in a weird time like this, um, <clears throat> people look to religion. Right. Um, what is your thoughts about just, I mean, the idea of being someone who knows religions and religions of the world, um, what is your thoughts about the role of religion in a time like this? Yeah, it's been really interesting to sort of watch. I'm not sure I know what the role of religion is, but I can tell you how religion has responded to this. Okay. Um, so, of course, there's no public gatherings of religious meetings anymore, um, which on the surface sounds simple enough. Um, but to just take the Catholic example, um, because I, I know it best, uh, when I was growing up, you couldn't watch... If you watched, stayed home and watched mass on TV, it didn't count as right. going to mass, right? There was a bunch of theological debate about how that doesn't count. It's not the same. And now all of a sudden, right? After a century, how long have we had TV? After all of this time of not letting that be real mass, all of a sudden Catholic theology has allowed this sort of thing to be real mass. Right. And I, I, maybe that sounds subtle, but that's actually a huge thing for Catholics to do on a dime. So there's like this interesting quickness to a religion that is not known for moving quickly at all. Um, similarly, we just had, uh, are we still in the middle of, or just finishing up um, Jewish Passover season? Yeah. It's like I attended a virtual Seder uh, with friends in Boston. I would not have driven to Boston on a Wednesday night to go to their Seder. <laughs> But since I just had to sit in my house, it was lovely to participate in their Seder. Right. So that's like sort of a cool, and Seder is, tends to be a home-based tradition. So that one actually translates pretty well in this oh, context. Okay. Right? So it's, you sort of tell the story of Passover with your family traditions embedded in it. So that one actually sort of works. Um, then I, some sort of sadder things is that... Um, <clears throat> In Islam, one of the important parts of preparing a body for uh, burial um, rites and funeral practices is the cleaning of the body. There's a ritual cleaning of the body that's really important. Um, and because it requires too many people too close to each other, there has not yeah. been allowance. You can't do it. Like right. the mosque over in West Springfield, a, a member over there was telling me that they haven't been able to perform the ritual clean cleanings of the body, which maybe to an outsider seems like no big deal. But this is like a very, you know, at like the end of life practices are sort of like where religion steps in. Um, so there's um, sort of interesting sort of figuring out how to do death practices and communal practices. Um, and then the other thing I'll just say is that there's been, of course, all of these like news stories about religious leaders who refuse to stop holding services. Mm -hmm. um, so it it's tending to be in evangelical Protestant circles, though I'm sure they're not the only ones, um, that are refusing to close down. They're, they're gathering. I mean, famously, the preacher in, I think it was Virginia, refused to close down, and then he died of COVID-19 a couple of weeks later. Like, it's sort of these terrible stories about people feeling so committed to their religious practice that they aren't listening to the public health experts. Right. So, some of like this huge range of ways religions are responding to this. And that, you know, that, that last one in particular is, has, has got to be a real, I mean, there, there's a lot of trickiness to each one of these, right? But the last one right. definitely gets into like the political realm of like, you know, like uh, governments telling people what they can and can't do. But even if we leave the political out, right, it's, it's almost like, you know, I feel that obligation as a professor to try to come into the virtual classroom or, and do my best. But if we had a classroom, I would be there, you know, even if that, <laughs> right. even if that meant, you know, personal risk to myself and hopefully me not risking them. But, you know, I think right. by the same token, some of these people, like I said, are so committed to the religion that it's not just about, Oh, I have to go, I have to go do the service. It's, I have to do the service because these people that are coming to the service also want or need it, you know? So it's a weird two way yeah. street. Absolutely. Yeah. It's been, um, there was this interesting sort of like, back and forth. So the Catholic, Catholic um, last rites ceremonies mandate, not ceremonies, ritual rites, mandate that a priest take a special anointed oil and put it with their hand, right? Catholics are all about the body. Put it with their hand onto 
the forehead or body part of the person who's dying. So there was this brief couple of days where the Diocese of Springfield said, you know what, it's not safe for our priests to be touching COVID patients with COVID-19. Uh, and so they allowed the nursing staff to like get the oil from the priest and then do the right with the, with the dying person and then go back and forth. So there's like this chance. But then the diocese reversed the allowance. So there's this like real indecisiveness about how, as you're talking about, like how do we be present to people in their moments of need? Oh, yeah. You know, death being an extreme example, but right. So even if it's just like you're feeling anxious or whatever it is, like how, how do ministers and religious leaders be present to people when presence is the one thing that we are not supposed to be doing? <laughs> I and I I haven't heard that, but I mean, could you also imagine? I mean, you know, one of the, one of the, like our healthcare workers, nurses, right? They're already doing so much, and could you imagine now? You're already you have to do your best to separate yourself from the patient already, but now you're being asked to administer one of these special service, like you said, an end an end of life service. Right. Oh my gosh. Wait, and what's what's like what's harder? Being asked to do that, or like not allowing the priest who the patient wants in there, right? There's just like, there's so much, yeah, there's just a lot of conflict in that moment. <laughs> yeah, not, not, not as easy as, you know, short little news stories or news clippets make it all sound, right? Right. Yeah, of course, right, of course. Uh, so, oh, that's, so that, that's totally crazy. So as someone who's an expert in religions, right, one of the, we don't maybe think of it this way, but I mean, a real emerging religion in the year 2020 is atheism, right? Um, absolutely. So do you think that is, – is anyone at some sort of advantage in a crisis situation like this, right? I mean, like, you could always say that, that, that there's a lot of – like, you know, religion should give you hope, right? So is there, is there a lack of hope for the atheist? I don't think so. Um, but I wonder if you, if you have some comments on, on that. Yeah, you know, let's – so let me back up two things. One is to say that – um, religion is not necessarily a good or a bad thing in the world. It's done all sorts of great things. Um, you know, they're members of the Sikh community are some of on the front lines of serving people right now. Absolutely. Um, religion is also forcing people to go to church when they shouldn't be going to church. Right. right. So religion as a thing is sort of morally, ethically, to my mind, neutral. Okay. Atheism Similarly, uh, but I want to say, I want to take it back from atheism and, and focus on the non-religious, uh, okay. people who don't affiliate with a particular religious tradition. Um, atheism is a subset of that. And stats seem to think that they're growing, but actually what counts as atheism as far as sociologists go, are, it's like super unclear. Yeah. People check the box and they don't necessarily, when you dig down on what they actually mean, it's, anyway, so to step, step it back from atheism to say uh, people who don't practice a religion. Um, and what's been interesting is the role, I think, of sort of spiritual practices, this sort of spiritual but not religious thing. So uh, I've seen there's a huge uptick in the number of people who are accessing meditation apps, which of course is a you know, Buddhist religious practice, but meditation apps are through the roof on sales. Um, yeah. There's an app called Downward Dog Yoga that's been giving its um, stuff for free to medical workers. Um, these are... You know, yoga, I guess, is something you can do at the YMCA, but it's, you know, it's, these are spiritual practices. Um, yeah. There's a beautiful podcast called On Being um, that talks about religious and spiritual ideas that offered a care package to people sort of without religious ties necessarily attached to it, but just sort of this like thinking about worry, thinking about memory, thinking about um, how to take deep breaths in this time, right? So there's been this sort of like... Um, Maybe the way to think about it is sort of softening of the edges of uh, the parts about religion that people don't like tend to be the rigidity, the yeah. forcefulness, the insistence on a particular way of being. Spirituality sort of comes in and says, you can have the good things you like about religion without all of that. And right. I think there's been a huge uptick in the sort of spiritual resources for people Yes. In the midst of this. So yeah. Seem, I mean, I, that's from a religion professor's perspective. <laughs> well, that, that makes a lot of sense. I mean, you, you can see this too in different, you know, the book sections at Barnes and Noble, right? I mean, spirituality, self-help. I mean, it's, it's everywhere, right? 
and it is everywhere not- and it's been particularly like vocal right now I think like um I, I mean I, I, I always think yoga is fascinating but like the fact that downward dog yoga app which is one of the bigger yoga apps would put all its stuff so first of all they gave it all for free to anybody through the end of April I think and now it's anybody who's a health worker can have it free for sort of <laughs> ad infinitum like forever Interesting. Um, so there's like what so what that means the reason this answers your or gets at your question is that there seems to be a hunger for some sort of spiritual or connection with something in this yes. time the definition of what that something is it's totally unclear to me it's probably unclear to people who are downloading downward dog app but like um that sort of driving desire for something does seem to be rising up um at this time and whether that's a quest for hope or um just connection you know i I think one of the things that i think religion can do it but spirituality certain people feel like spirituality can do it is like have a a relationship connections um and it seems like people are hungry for that well i hope i'm you know i'm I'm always looking for the positive takeaways of how we can come out of this scenario and my hope is that yeah maybe one of the positives that people are searching for something maybe they have the time or if not necessarily the time, they have at least the space to, the, 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 to just really focus, hyper-focus on something, whether it's about themselves, <laughs> internally, yeah. you know, the way you interface with the world, whatever that is, you know. Yeah. Um, I could tell you for myself, it's a, I've been trying to focus on not taking the little things for granted right now, you know, because. Yeah, that's, that's a big one, yeah. I was someone who always, I, I always live in the next thing. What's the next thing I got to do? What's the next <laughs> thing I got to get to? Whereas like, oh, man, right. I'm missing so much by doing that, you know? And so this is a real it's moment true, to right. slow down. Right. And that so can be maybe, a spiritual practice depending on your orientation. Yeah. So let me, let me, let me ask you this. So, so we, we, we talked about it briefly in the beginning there about my conversation with Bob, you know, religion versus, versus, uh, science, right? Have you read or have seen the movie Contact? No. Oh gosh, I I recommend it to, <laughs> to everyone. I I personally, okay. I'll give you the thirty second sales pitch. Um, okay. And I have a soft spot in my heart for Matthew McConaughey, but that's not the hero there. Um, <laughs> it's 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 the best um, story that I've ever seen that portrays the opposing positions of a single. Um, of a single uh, thing. So basically the idea is that we think we made contact with aliens. We think, we don't know, okay? And it takes place from the point of view of a scientist, an astronomer, um, a theologian, and a politician. And what does each one think about this and how do they interact and how do they agree and how do they disagree? Great story, I think. Um, Yeah, okay, that sounds awesome. But, you know, it's so, so, but a movie like that makes it, and it, it's, it's written, or the, the book was written by Carl Sagan, you know, Carl Sagan, great oh, yeah, yeah. scientific mind. Um, but I bring it up as a good example because that movie, in my opinion, portrays that there is this battle between science and religion that I, I don't necessarily know outside of just people, you know, maybe saying we do what we do better than you or something like this. You know, I don't, I don't right. see that battle. So I was wondering what your take on it is. Yeah, yeah. Students, I had a student last semester who really had this, this was a big question for her. Um, I guess I don't get too wound up about it. And it might be my own Catholic background. To my mind, there's just not a great opposition. And that, ha- I think that that's not true for every religious tradition. Um, I think if you think that the Bible is a historically accurate days counting sort of document and you go to the Creation Museum, that yeah, science has got, to, it's a little bit tricky for you. Um, but historically religion and science have been puzzled by similar questions about how the world works. Why are we here? What do we do with the fact that we're here? How do we live our best lives while we're here? And science and theology and religion have had different ways of answering that question, but it seems like they're not necessarily opposed to each other from my perspective. I, I, I realize some people feel like they they really are. Um, but to my mind, I don't know, they can sort of inform one another. And I don't, I'm not a scientist. I'm not a mathematician. Yeah. Um, but when I look out at the world, I'm like, 
I don't see why they can't coexist. You know, like I'm standing on the top of a mountain a couple of days ago, right? Like, it seems like there's a lot of, to my mind, God, but also clear science happening right there. Um, so, I th- so I will say, James, part of it is lost on me. I don't quite understand the conflict deep, deeply yeah. well enough. I don't, I actually don't understand it either. I mean, mm-hmm. I, I, and I think that, I think that, I don't, I don't want to generalize for all scientists because I think a lot of scientists do gen, do identify as atheists. But I think that a, yeah. a, a lot of physicists in particular would just be more, kind of more agnostic about the issue or more agnostic about the question saying that, you know, ah, religion mm-hmm. does their thing, we do our thing. And like, you know, s- physicists are very good at saying what we know and then very good at dodging other questions. Right. And so like right. the, the question of what happened before the Big Bang is one that we just say, well, physics can't answer that. Right. Well, well. Oh, that's interesting. Right. Right. That's an interesting question. Right. And so then there's sort of a partitioning of responsibilities. Yes. I, I think we're good yeah. at that. Yeah, that's interesting. And I think some religions are good at that. Um, and some religions are less good at that. Right. Like um, the Dalai Lama actually not that long ago made a statement about how Buddhism is totally aligned with science, um, which is sort of hard because there's also like a really deep shamanistic tradition. Yes. Tibetan Buddhism in particularly is, has a lot of Tibetan magic bound into it. And then here comes the Dalai Lama, oh, science and Buddhism are totally fine, right? Like, you know, so yeah. there's lots of different ways religions go at it. So the word that you used partitioning, I thought was a really interesting one um, about the way that scientists maybe partition this out and, and kind of kick the yeah. can about the issue. I, <laughs> I think, I think, you know, like I said, like we said before, you know, there was a time when all of us, we're all getting at the same thing from different angles and we kind of part ways. Yeah. I have a feeling there is, there is one issue that's making it all come back around and that's the issue of understanding consciousness, right? What is, what is consciousness? And that, that's been a question that I think, for a long time, biologists, chemists, physicists, all just completely ignored. No one wanted to touch that. But in the last couple mm-hmm. of years, people have been starting to come around and really try to scientifically answer this question. And it mostly be- really? spawns because of we're getting very close to some sort of real version of AI, right? Oh, interesting, right? Like where, where does the human being actually begin? Yeah. Yeah, so I, so I think that scientifically, um, we're going to attack consciousness and then that's when we're going to start turning to other people who might have been saying something about this for years that we've you know just kind of been going our merry way about i think it's going to be an interesting time you know, it, there's it's sort of an emerging subfield in the past decade in religious studies is religion and, and ai and it has to do with this question of um you know if if my robot goes to church for me did i go to church i mean it gets down to questions like that right the nature of the human being, right? These kinds of things. But then there's interesting, to go back to Buddhism, Buddhism talks about um, six senses instead of five, and consciousness is the sixth one, right? They have it as a whole separate right. taste, smell. I can't list them all. Um, so it's interesting to think about how different cultures and different religious norms have taken up this question of what counts as, as conscious. And then Right, and then we get into questions about is, is conscience related to the soul? Do we have souls as human beings? Different religious traditions answer that differently. Um, yeah, and this, so if there is sort of a conscience, is it a permanent status? Is it something that can shift? If it can shift, can AI actually imitate it? Right, these are the questions, right, that theologians and religious study scholars are thinking about. And I, it's interesting to think about physics trying to like come up with a scientific or mathematical root of. Well, that that's why I think that that's why I think that there's going to come a time where these two groups have to have yeah, to that's unify Be, because right. you just labeled off a lot of things you know, right there about you know about is it shifting is it permanent et cetera et cetera. Right. I think from the physics perspective you know, physics, what do you do? You, you make a theory and then you make a, a, a test that you can do, or you, you make an experiment that can test it, right. you make predictions and you match the data against the predictions. But this is one that we don't actually know what we're looking for, right? Like, like it, <laughs> it's, it, right. it's hard to make a thesis. Yeah, like, like, like what, we don't know the answer of what is conscious, like, what, like a proton is like, well, we know what a proton is, right? We know how to look for that, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But maybe some other people have some answers that we might be able to say, well, we could look for that at least as a first experiment, you know? 
Um, yeah, that's so I feel like right, yeah. that's going to come together at some point uh, in, in what I think is a, a totally fascinating way. Yeah, that'll be interesting. That's, yeah, that's, that's fascinating to know. I didn't know physics. I didn't know physics was looking at those questions. This is not everybody. It's still considered like, you know, like that's like the crazy physicist, no offense, um, do, do that, you know. Um, I mean, no offense to my, my <laughs> physics people who study it, but there are groups that are coming together. And right. you know, what they're really asking for, right, is that the laws of quantum mechanics, right, they dictate oh. the, the world of the smallest things, right, and they dictate things that, you know, Heisenberg uncertainty says that there's some randomness to it, right, but okay, but at some point, right, you have a system with so many particles, they all have random things, we can make accurate predictions on them. But at some point, that system goes from being a system that we make predictions about just things moving back and forth, to it being, I don't know, something like a cell. And all of a sudden, processes, yeah. start, processes start happening right. that were not part of the Schrodinger equation, right? I, I'm, I'm, I'm making that somewhat hyperbolic, but you get the idea, right, is that there's some emergent phenomena that the physics can't explain. Um, and right. when you have emergent phenomena, do you call that instinct? Or if you have enough instinct, do you call that a set of constructs right. or, or consciousness? I don't know. But people are starting to ask these questions from both the biological side and from the physics side. Oh, that's fascinating. Right. And then different religious traditions are going to step in and say, well, that space there is God. That's the sort of undefinable mystery. So let me ask you one, uh, one more, and thank you for giving me so much of your time. As you can see, I, I really like this yeah. stuff. Um, <laughs> yeah, no, it's lovely. I, yeah. let's, say, let's say 10 years from now, right, or even tomorrow, right, we, we you know, go into a lab, we construct this like, thing that we believe is conscious, we believe it's AI, right? <laughs> what does this mean for religion? Like, like, I guess what I'm, what I'm maybe asking yeah. is, do, does the AI have a religion then? Because we right, become there, its creator. Is, Mm -hmm. like what does that yeah, mean? I mean religion has... good sorry no 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 I think um so one way religious I, it's more of a theological question than a religious studies question so I, I'm a little out of my area but um some people have wondered if there's like a god gene which is maybe hyperbolic but like are some you earlier pointed to the fact that the fastest growing religion in the United States is people who don't affiliate with a religious tradition. So the right. nuns, N-O-N-E-S-S. -S. Um, some people have wondered if there's like something ingrained in some people that orient them to religious belief, religious practice, liking religious community in a way that is like foundation, fundamentally different than a person who doesn't feel a connection to those things, right? So you, you might just assume it's cultural, right? My parents didn't raise me religious, I'm not gonna go to, right. but, but then there's a whole other set of people who wonder if some people are just instinctually more likely to practice a religious tradition. There's something genetic about it. Is there something ingrained in what it means to be a human being that has been shifting in humanity? And that is part of, I mean, in addition to sports practice on Sunday mornings, right? Like it <laughs> is part of why less, I mean, it's not just Christianity. It's not just in the United States. Um, right. Uh, it's too much to say across the globe, but across the global West and North, religion is, you know, falling off statistically. Um, so people have wondered if there's something about human existence that has shifted, that has made religion less, I don't know, meaningful or like made people less oriented toward religion. Yeah. Um, and before we, came, before we started this, we were talking about sort of this question about what happens after pandemic. Are we going to see yeah. less religion? It's more religious practice. And I think, you know, it's anyone's guess, but um, it does seem to me like this sort of moment, it does seem like a pivot point for religious communities. Like some religious communities are doing an excellent job of maintaining, you know, online community, et cetera. But, you know, you can't just like drop into a ch church or a synagogue or right. I have a, a meeting to go. And, you know, um, you can't just mean to show up at a Zoom meeting with an address, right? <laughs> so, right. Um, so right, it could continue that trend, but the other way it could go is that people feel this sort of this angst, this sort of like desire for more, right? like Kierkegaard calls it the, the sort of the, the, the desire to leap, to make the, the, the jump. Um, 
and that, you know, it's possible that it could lead people to be more interested in religion or religious questions and like find formal ways of practicing. So it's really an interesting, yeah, I'm very, I, I don't know what's going to happen. I don't, I don't, I don't know how to take bets on these things, but, but yeah, we'll, no, we'll see. I, I, I think it's, it's an interesting time for some of those questions. I mean, I, I, I right. you know, I, 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 I don't have, ever wish for like three wishes, you know, but, um, if I had, if I had a wish, one of them would be if, if, you know, if, uh, I could have a pill that like guarantees me like three days to come back to life after I die, but not, not in succession, but like one of the days I want to be around for is like, if we ever get to AI and what, what it looks like, I, I yeah. want to see, that, you know, right. Do you, um, does, does AI go to church every Sunday? I mean, this is like a very interesting, do they feel that pull, right? Do they feel the existential angst that leads a lot of people to go to church? I, How could I, they? Why would why would we program somebody to feel that? Except that it's sort of a beautiful thing to be drawn to these things. Right, right. Well, are you, have you watched this show on HBO called Westworld at all? No, because only because I don't have, I don't have yeah. access to HBO, but I've been wanting to. It's it, it addresses all these questions, right? That you know, if if you okay. were to if you were programming robots that are conscious, right? What do you yeah. give them versus not give them? Do you give them suffering? And some yeah, would say it, it's, exactly. it's morally wrong to give them suffering, but some people say, well, what's, what's by giving them suffering it gives them something real that makes you or makes you mad. Humans wouldn't be humans without suffering, right? Um, yeah, exactly, right. So it, it touches on all these exact questions. So I highly oh, interesting. I highly endorse it. I obviously don't get paid by the right. writers, <laughs> but it's <laughs> flashing but, under the screen. Is that, <laughs> that's right. That's right. <laughs> but it's, it's, it, it, it's, it's been a show that has made me think about some of this stuff um, more than any um, kind of just passing the time thing would, as opposed to sitting yeah. down and like devoting time to it. So it's something you might find interesting. You might find interesting. Yeah. I'll check it out. That's thanks. That's a good recommendation. All right, so let me just leave on, on, a, on a, a good note. So to your students or to my students that are watching this, yeah. right, and we're all go kind of going through this, what advice do you have or, or what message would you send to students in this yeah. crazy time? Um, yeah, one of the things I keep telling my students is I'm as in the dark as you are about this. Um, we are really in this together. Um, this is not online education. This is uh, distance learning in a crisis mode, <laughs> right? Um, so, you know, I really appreciate when I hear from students when I like, you know, here's the other thing is I've got deadlines just to like help keep you on pace, but I don't care if you miss a deadline. Like right. just be in touch. Like I I'm not that hard about right. those things. Anyway, but like, um, I don't care. You know, I get it. Like, if this is an unprecedented time and I know it's hard to show up for Zoom. I know it's hard to come to office hours. Um, yeah, but I, uh, I will say, so, so James, I have my, my students call me Professor Dugan just to like help me remember that I'm a professor and I keep accidentally starting to write all the best Kate to my yeah. students, which I'm saying to, to students on board, like, I'm feeling like, as in the mix as any of you about all of this. Absolutely. Um, so. No, I think that's yeah, a good message because we, we are in it together. Right? We didn't ask for this no more than anybody else to ask for this, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Right, so it's, it's balance. Awesome. Yeah. Thanks for doing this, James. This is cool. Thank you for giving me so much of your time. And, uh, you know, I know yeah, that you got a, a lot on your plate and everything else, but this has been great. And, um, yeah. you know, I, I get I get to hang out with Kate every Wednesday for our curriculum committee commitments, <laughs> which is not as fun as talking about this, but also very important. So we can't yes, not do it. These are the things. Um, awesome. But I I thank you once again, and you know I hope that your students enjoy this. I know that mine will. Um, and yeah, so yeah I'll I'll let them know about it. Great, and maybe cool. we got to get me, you, and Bob together. That might be the, the way to do the next. Yeah, that'd one. be fun. That'd be fun. All right, awesome. thank you so much. You All have right. a great night. Bye, James. Have a good night. See you later. Bye.